Now I'm going to turn this diode into a transistor. And before I do that, I'm going to turn it sideways because that's the way I like to draw it. So here's our piece of intrinsic silicon. And now we're going to dope it such that we have two junctions. So let's make a junction here and a junction here. We'll make this an NPN transistor. So there will be N-type material here, P-type material here, and N type material here. And let's make some connections to it. This region is called the collector, so there's the connection to the collector. This region is called the emitter, so here's the connection to the emitter. And this region is called the base, and there's the connection to it. And the base is actually very thin in an actual bipolar junction transistor on the order of maybe 8 to 10 nanometers thick. And that's part of what makes it work. But to facilitate me drawing the charge carriers and depletion regions, I'm making that thick in this schematic type drawing here. And I'm also going to move these out of the material so I have room to draw my charge carriers. So that is N-type material, P-type material, and N-type material. Okay, so the emitter region is very heavily doped, meaning there's a lot of extra donor atoms in there, meaning there's a lot of electrons that are sort of free to move around. Of course, each one is connected with a proton in its particular atom, such as arsenic or whatever is being used to dope this region. And the base region is very lightly doped. I'm just going to draw a few holes in the base region compared to a lot of, I'm going to draw even more here just to emphasize that this is very, very heavily doped and lots and lots of electrons there floating around. And the collector region is also fairly lightly doped. So let's just put a few minus signs up here representing just a few electrons. So now we're set up to see how the transistor works. So just sitting there, of course, we're going to have these electrons jump into these holes, creating a depletion region up in this area. So let's go ahead and draw that. So there's one depletion region. And these electrons are going to jump into those holes, creating another depletion region over here. So let's go ahead and draw that. And let's draw the junction line back in there. And let's show the depletion regions with some purplish lines here. So we can remember that there's the depletion regions. And let's draw these few charge carriers back in here. Not very many, but there's a few in the base region. OK, so there's our two depletion regions. Now let's put some voltage on here. Let's get rid of these. They're kind of taking up space. I'll just relabel those with collector, emitter, and base. And let's put a battery on here. Don't care what the voltage is, just some battery. There's the positive side, there's the negative side. So what's going to happen? Well. We're going to have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage there. And how's that going to affect the transistor? Well, we've got two depletion regions. So there's going to be theoretically no current flowing in here because we have two areas of insulation in there. But in reality, there's going to be a tiny bit of current because some electrons are going to from heat or other excitation will jump away from their atoms and be able to move around. So we will get a very, very tiny current in there on the order of some transistors down in the nanoamps, maybe others in the microamps. We will have a tiny bit of current flow. So there will be a voltage gradient across here. So I'm going to just draw my B here because I want to draw a small plus sign right there. Let's make a big plus sign here and a smaller plus sign there and a negative sign there representing the voltages. So 
We have a large positive voltage here and a smaller positive voltage there. Now remember that negative voltage is not the opposite of positive voltage. It's just some lower voltage. I usually say that a negative voltage is a voltage that's lower than some other voltage that we've called zero. But of course, when we have a battery and have not designated a zero voltage yet, we're going to have a positive on one side that's going to be our highest voltage and a negative on the other side that's going to be our lowest voltage. And so in this case, negative is just some other voltage that's lower than a voltage that is positive, just the lower voltage. So we have a very positive voltage and less positive, a lower voltage. So as far as this junction is concerned, we have a positive voltage on the N side and a negative voltage on the P side, reverse biasing that junction. So what's going to happen to the depletion region? It's going to get a little bigger. So let's go ahead and draw that a little bit larger. And now we have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage there. So on this junction, we have a positive on the P and a negative on the N. So that's going to forward bias that. We're not going to have a lot of current flow, so I'll just make this one a little bit smaller. Okay, so now we're set up there for it to work. So there will be a tiny bit of current flowing through here that's going to be current flowing into the collector, which we call our collector current, or I sub C for collector current. And the current that flows under this condition where we have a battery biasing the transistor from the collector to the emitter, but nothing on the base. The base is open. We call that current ICBO. So that's a parameter you will see in the data sheets. The ICBO is the current under this condition. There's a battery biasing the, the transistor, nothing on the base, and we will get a tiny bit of leakage current in the order of nanoamps to microamps. So there we have that, and we're set up for seeing what makes the transistor do what it does. Now another thing I need to do is switch what we usually do in this class, which is talking about conventional flow and start talking about electron flow because on an NPN transistor, it's easiest to see how it works if we follow the electrons. So in this class, we almost always use conventional current and that's because using conventional current, it's easy to visualize what goes on in a circuit because current flows from positive to negative, high pressure to low pressure, that makes sense, and it's easy to visualize how the currents flow in a circuit if we use conventional current. And I'm not alone in that. Virtually everybody in the industry and in academia uses conventional current. I know there's those of you out there who really like electron flow, and if that works for you, that's no problem for me, but most of the industry uses conventional flow, and I like conventional flow because it's easy to visualize how circuits work. But once in a while, we have to change to electron flow to look at specific devices, for example, vacuum tubes. We have to follow the electrons, and in an NPN transistor, it really helps to follow the electrons to understand what it does. So we are going to switch to electron flow for this particular model here to see how it works. All right, so now what we want to do is put some signal on the base. We want some current going into the base. Let's put a battery here and make that a variable battery so we can control the current going into the base. And this is just a current limiting resistor just so we see it's there. And notice that we have a common connection right here. We have a collector circuit over here where current flows in the collector. We're looking at conventional current for a moment. Current is flowing in the collector circuit and current flows in the base circuit, and they're independent of each other. Of course, they combine for the emitter current, but they split back off, and so we have separate circuits for the collector and separate circuits for the base, but their common connection is at the emitter. So this is called a common emitter configuration. So now what we want to do is adjust this so we get some current in the base. Once again, it's going to be electron flow, so it's going to flow in the emitter and out the base. So there's a little bit of current. I'm going to make this a dashed line because it's not a lot of current. So what's that going to do? Well, that bit of current is going to create a greater voltage across this junction, and therefore we have more bias on there. And so we're going to have even more negative and stronger positive across this forward bias junction here. So what's going to happen? The 
depletion region is going to get even smaller. How small can I draw it? Well, there it's getting closer and closer. And of course, what we have going on in this area here, we have electrons jumping into holes. So the electrons are flowing this way, jumping into the holes and disappearing. The holes are flowing that way and the electrons jump into them. And now there's no longer a hole or an electron. But of course, what happens is that those are replaced. The electrons are replaced by the negative voltage here. The holes are replaced by the positive voltage here. And so we have a current flow. Hole flow in this direction, electron flow in that direction. And we're just going to look at the electrons for a second. They're flowing this way. So we're starting to get some conduction on this forward biased junction here. And as we increase that current, this depletion region is going to get smaller and smaller. Well, of course, with that smaller depletion region having less and less resistance to current flow, what's going to happen to these electrons? All these electrons floating around here, they're going to start drifting over into the base region. Now, drift is a physical term used when we have an abundance of something over here and uh, less of it over here, and so they're going to tend to fill that area. Now, of course, there's forces preventing that because each one of these electrons belongs to a donor atom over here. So they're not going to go very far, at least under these conditions, but they will be able to drift a little bit because of the nature of the semiconductor materials that we've discussed earlier. So they can drift over into the base area a little bit. And the fact that the base area is very thin comes into play now because we have a big depletion region here that's non-conductive. So where can these electrons go? They can't go very far because there's no conduction over here. There's not a whole lot of holes for them to jump into over here because that's lightly doped. There's only so much current. So the electrons drift over there and there's not really too much they can do because of this big depletion region, this big non-conducting area where they can't go. Except, why does this depletion region even exist? We have this big positive charge up here that is literally sucking the electrons out of this area of the crystal. So all the electrons, what there are, I'll just draw a couple more in there, are being sucked that way out of the depletion region by that positive charge. So what's going to happen if we get some more electrons anywhere near that depletion region? they're going to be sucked right on through into the collector area. In fact, we have electrons being emitted from the emitter and being sucked into the collector. So even though we have a depletion region here, it's there because of this positive charge and any electrons that get in there are going to be, get sucked out. And of course, those electrons can now be replaced from this negative charge here. This positive charge is going to suck them back out. So now we have a current flow. And the current flow is going to be some proportion to our base current. So let's say we have a ratio of this particular transistor of uh, in the collector 10 to 1. So there's our base region. There's our collector region. So if we have one electron flowing from the emitter out the base, for every one of those, we'll get 10. It depends on the transistor. We'll talk about this in a moment. So for this particular transistor, for every electron that flows, into the emitter and out of the base, we get 10 electrons flowing from the emitter through the base and into the collector. And if we double this current, let's say we have one milliamp of base current right now. If the ratio of this particular transistor is 10 to one, what do we get for our collector current? Let's reverse that to electron flow. We're going to get 10 milliamps. If we double this to two milliamps, we're going to get 20 milliamps. So a little bit of base current causes a much bigger collector current. We increase the base current, we increase the collector current, and the collector current is much bigger than the base current by a known ratio depending on the particular transistor. So that's basically how a transistor works. And if we flip this around to be a PNP transistor, let's just go ahead and do that. It works the same, it's just that we follow the holes instead of the electrons, so we follow different majority carriers. Let's draw it real quickly. There is our silicon. There's our two junctions. So our collector has lots, has a few holes in it. Remember, the collector is not really heavily doped. I'll just draw a few there. The base, let's draw our connections here. The base has a few electrons in it, but the emitter has lots and lots and lots of holes because it's heavily doped. 
draw a few more just to emphasize how heavily doped that is. Let's put our battery over here. Now we want the negative to the collector and the positive to the emitter. And over here we have our base current generator, a variable voltage plus a current limiting resistor. So now we can do conventional current because in the PNP transistor, we want to follow the holes because those are the majority carriers in this particular transistor. So now we get a little bit of flow from the emitter to the base. Now we're doing conventional flow, positive, negative, big negative charge up here, smaller negative charge here, big positive charge here. We get a little bit of current from the emitter through the base. This depletion region is going to get smaller, so it's very easy for these holes to drift into the base region. So some of them are going to drift in there across that forward biased junction. So now we are getting holes in the base region. And now we have this big depletion region up here. There's our big depletion region, non-conductive area. But why is that depletion region there? Because we have this big negative charge sucking the holes out of it. And so these holes can drift into this area. And as soon as they get anywhere near that depletion region, this negative charger is going to suck them right out too. So now once we get that flow into the collector, these can flow into the battery and new current can flow in now from positive to replacing those holes. So holes are flowing out of the emitter into the base and being sucked into the collector and out and being replenished. And now we have a flow. There's our base circuit and there is our collector circuit. And that is what makes a bipolar transistor do what it does.